Polymers can also exist with lots of different variation in their structure. What do I mean? Well, we've talked about it a little bit with polyethylene. We said that there's polyethylene where it's just basically one long strand. That was high-density polyethylene because these things can pack together really nicely. But then we also said that there's linear low-density polyethylene because it's got a couple of side branches off the side. And then there's low-density polyethylene, which has these long branches coming off the side of it, which is not going to allow it to be compact together very well. So that's the difference between linear branched, uh, linear and branched polymers. You can also have cross-linking, which we've just mentioned. Uh, cross-linking in things like elastomers, right? Instead of having your chains just slide past each other, what if you put some sulfur here? and that sulfur was able to bond both those chains together. Well, now what happens if I pull this chain, it's also going to drag this one along, right? And when I let go, it's going to want to restore it. So this leads to elastic response, right? And again, these are permanent covalent bonds between the chains. Uh, and again, when they discovered vulcanized rubber, it was because he accidentally added a little bit of sulfur to the uh, natural rubber that he was working with. Total accident when he discovered it. Okay. And then you've got network polymers. This is like the example of Bakelite. Remember, Bakelite had these benzene rings. And then off of those benzene rings, you had CH2, you had CH2, CH2, and then you had an OH group. So the OH group's not important, but these CH2 groups are very important because each one of them can bond to something else. So now you get this three-dimensional structure. Instead of just bonding in a line, it can bond in three dimensions, and that's a network polymer, right? It creates a similar effect to cross-linking. If you cross-linked everything, then you end up with a network polymer, okay? Now, there's other things to think about. For example, there's molecular configurations. If the repeat unit is always the exact same way, the exact same order, then that's called head to tail. So take, for example, here, let's say you've got this. It looks like PVC, for example. If R was chlorine, if that's what your functional group was, was a chloride, this would be PVC. PVC can form head to tail, right? This is your head, and that's your tail, that's your head, and that's your tail. That's one way to put these together. But you could also do head to head, right? Here they've got tail to tail, and then you'd have head to head, and so forth, right? So that's example of head to head or tail to tail. Um, lots of different configurations you put together. The side groups, if they're present, they can also choose which side they're going to be on. Right? We call this isomerism, right? So stereoisomerism, you've got isotactic versus syndiotactic versus atactic. What do these mean? If it's isotactic, iso means the same, isotactic means they're all on the same side. For example, here in polystyrene, you've got that big benzene ring off the side of your, of your polystyrene. If they're always on the same side, then this would be isotactic polystyrene. If it's alternating, if it's, it's switching from one side to the other, right? See how that switches back and forth? That becomes syndiotactic polystyrene. And if it's just random, atactic means it doesn't have, so it doesn't have order, atactic polystyrene. Where you have double bonds, you can get geometric isomerism, right? So for example, we have this double bond. If you have the functional group on the same side, right? Then you have cis bonding. If it's on opposite signs, then now you have trans bonding. So you can imagine that all of these have influence on the properties that you measure, right? What, take about this one, right? If these are all different polystyrenes, which one do you think would be the most crystalline? Isotactic, syndiotactic, or atactic? Well, probably isotactic, because if they're all on the one side, they're going to be able to line up better and be more crystalline. If they're more crystalline, they tend to have higher strength and higher stiffness, right? And a higher melting point. If it's atactic, you get the opposite of all those properties. So understanding these molecular configurations has an impact on things you care about, like strength, processability, when it's going to melt, uh, things that we care about.